Right. Good morning. Good morning to chairpersons and my colleagues. It's actually an honor to be uh, speaking at WDS firstly and to speak with people like uh, Dr. Afshan and Chaturvedi sir. It's really an honor. Thank you very much. Now, uh, just a little bit about the title. Why am I saying I should see what they're showing? That's not a very commonly used title. You usually hear stuff like I will see what the brain knows. But till the time your eyes don't see it, your brain is not going to analyze it. And if your brain doesn't analyze it, obviously you don't know what to see. So getting into more broad aspect from a general practitioner point of view, everybody knows what oral pathology is. I don't know if it's the most hated subject in third year. I can see a few of my students say, I don't know if they really like me, but nevertheless. So it's a specialized field of diagnostic histopathology which deals with diseases of the mouth and jaws and the associated structures such as the ear, nose and throat. And any person who is majoring in this is basically known as an oral pathologist. But give that a thought because the scope of oral pathology essential is obviously when there is normal, there is bound to be abnormal. That's a law of nature. All the diseases of the oral cavity, mind you, all of them, if you all remember your textbook from third year, absolutely everything from caries to pulpitis to periapitis to swellings to tumors to cancers everything is considered under oral pathology because pathology is basically dealing with abnormal we are all pathologists at the end of the day isn't it if you're sitting in the clinic you're diagnosing you're diagnosing something or other not necessarily oral cancers but you are do you think it's really only theory that's a way i would say that's a misnomer as con uh, concerned by a uh, few of our teachers a few of our Previous doctors have been, uh, spoken about it. We see abnormalities every day. Pathology is obviously going to be our bread and butter. One has to know how what is normal exactly to diagnose abnormal. We all know what is disease. Pathology is obviously going to be pretty much in our daily decisions. Now, this was a very interesting article written by one of my colleagues, Dr. Sarode from Pune, saying an opinion matters. And he highlighted the OB part of it, which is an oral pathologist. Essentially, he said there's a lot of dis uh, disagreement in clinical diagnosis when it comes to clinicians and pathologists and the reason for him to write this article. The practice of sending oral biopsies directly to oral pathologists, he suggested, would be the best prospect because obviously oral people know what is there in the oral cavity. They know what are the different variations in it. And tissues, I don't know how many surgeons are here. I don't mean to offend anyone. But tissues is sent all together to one pathologist, definitely will aid in proper diagnosis as they will prevent the improper distribution of the lesion tissue. This is more for the surgeons and the general practitioners. Now, we are all dentists. We are all general practicing dentists. I have done that after my BTS and then I got into masters after a good couple of years of practice. We all examine teeth. Everybody agrees? We all examine teeth, right? But why do we stick only to teeth? Aren't we specialists of the oral cavity altogether? So should we stick only to the teeth? The person has come to you, he's got a carious law 6, you see he requires a root canal, he requires a crown, you suggest that, so on and so forth. But have you even reflected the mucosa to check it once? That is where I say that we should always examine the mucosa as well along with the tooth. You can examine the buccal mucosa, the lip, all by reflection. As Chaturvedi Sir said excellently, one of the best methods is visual examination. Don't overlook this. It's the simplest thing to do. You have the mirror, you have the probe. All you have to do is just push the mucosa, see if there's any lesion or not. It'll be a fraction of a second and you'll know it. That's the reason. I as well see what they're shown. Can you diagnose from radiology? We have read a few articles these days, unfortunately, because medical legal is going a little strong with dentistry and there is an axe on the dentist's head. Uh, saying that doctor suggested an x-ray and there was seen, the dentist suggested an x-ray and there was a cancerous tumor or something which the patient was advised, misadvised, wrongly advised into it. Uh, you will require radiology, definitely. You will require it, but essentially pre-cancers and cancers are always going to be soft tissue abnormalities. If you've noted it and if there is something that you can, you want to suggest uh, for the investigation or for the test, CT scans would be by far the best which are required, which are a must before a surgeon takes over an oral cancer case. But provided all of this, again I emphasize on the point that the patient is examined correctly. Coming to setup, everybody has this thing, everybody has this fear as to oral pathology, oral surgery, oral cancer. It requires a huge setup, it requires a lot of things. Again, as of Shaman and Chaturvedi sir said, it can be done in the most basic setups, either in your clinic or in a community practice. Our regular clinic essentially consists of a dental chair. It may be as fancy as shown in the photograph, but thanks to 
the internet for the resources. It, it has to consider of a dental chair, it has to consider of your basic equipment, basic instruments around, and considering the fact that a lot of dentists are entering the implant world today, a routine dental surgical setup is something which is going to have the most basic instruments. For example, your implant kit, your scalpel, your retractors, tissue dissecting forceps, so on and so forth. Just a bare minimum. Actual requirement for a biopsy to confirm any case is even smaller than that because all you have to do is just remove a piece of the tissue that requires barely a scalpel, tissue dissecting forceps, sutures and LA, something which is there in every dental clinic, something which is there in dental vans these days, something which is also provided at the community based uh, centers that we go to. A lot of people ask that we have planned a biopsy, so what about the uh, material that it's supposed to be stored in, obviously commonly known as formalin, but you're never going to do a biopsy in an OPD procedure, are you? If anybody agrees to that, please raise their hands, because when the patient walks in, you tell them that there is a white patch on the buckle mucosa, do you actually think you'll tell the patient sit down and take a scalpel and remove a piece of tissue? The patient's not going to agree. And considering the stiff competition, nobody wants to lose their patients as well, right? So obviously it's not going to be an OPD procedure. You're going to plan it, you're going to give the patient an appointment. You can always arrange for formalin either by the local chemist store, you can contact the pathologist, the surgeon, whoever, and they'll accordingly make the arrangements for it. Right? Now, after a biopsy is done, what do you do next? The thing you expect from the pathologist, that is a histopathological report. Why do you need the histopathological report? Because histopath diagnosis is pretty much considered to be a gold standard for final diagnosis. When I've spoken about it in my previous slide, it said a disagreement between the clinician and the pathologist. That was because at times there is an ulcer which the clinician will say, it looks definitely malignant, we should biopsy it. And in that case, when you see the biopsy, it turns out to be something which is benign. In that case, of course, we say that histopath diagnosis is pretty much the gold standard for final diagnosis. Unfortunately, with an increased incidence of cancer, in a lot of families these days, I'm sure a lot of people over here have known or seen cancer patients closely. Whenever a biopsy is done, you know how important it is for the report to come, how desperately you wait for those five days to pass so that the tissue is processed, the pathologist sees it and he gives the final report and you're just praying with crossed fingers that it's not a malignant report. So I can't stress on the importance more of it is the pathological report. Now considering the fact that we are all general dentists, we are the one who have seen the patient the first time. The second thing is we are referring and we are calling a specialist. But the specialist is going to come, he is going to perform the biopsy, you will get a report in your hand. You as general dentist will be responsible for handing over the report to the patient. Because of which I say that interpretation of the histopath report and overview is something what you should understand and what you should know. Because the patient is obviously going to ask you, being the doctor, being the doctor who has referred him elsewhere. Right? A typical histopath report, which basically deals with the data of the patient with relevant clinical information and detailed histopathological description. Breaking it up into smaller parts, of course you need the personal data of the patient to avoid any confusion of reports. The second thing is there will always be a gross examination mentioned, which will give us the information about the specimen received by the lab and a clinical impression, which is extremely important for us pathologists because we need to know what the clinician thinks because when the clinician is going to tell you some particular thing, if he thinks it's malignant, it's because of how the lesion appears clinically. Always remember, you are taking a section which is probably 4 to 4.5 micron thick, but the biopsy in total must be around 2 to 3 mm minimum. Right? We are seeing only a very thin section of it because of which we need to know. If the clinician feels it's a malignancy, we make multiple sections of the biopsy, so on and so forth. Hence, giving a lot of importance to the clinical impression. The other thing is microscopic features pretty much reserved for the pathologist because this will be all the microscopic features which is going to be in depth explained. Suppose if the patient has to go for a second referral, he's carrying the report along with him. He shows it for a second opinion. The other pathologist should understand as to why I have reported in a certain way. What features did I see which made me arrive at a particular diagnosis. For that, we usually describe the microscopic features in depth. And uh, as I said, it's for a second referral if required. Lastly, diagnosis, of course, you have diagnosis which we usually mention consistent with if it is typical of a particular disease or suggestive of because as you know, we read textbooks, but textbooks are a collection after seeing thousands and thousands of cases. 
they will always give you the typical features. In our practice, 90% of the cases are going to be of the textbook photograph, because of which we say that it is suggestive of all these features together collaborate, and they are probably suggestive of this. Probable, sorry, that's a wrong term, because we are pretty much giving a final diagnosis. And lastly, the report will always be limited to the sample submitted. So in case of any discrepancy, always make sure that the entire sample is submitted to the pathologist. Then, this is something which I don't know a lot of people included on, but I've started practicing this since the last, you can say, two to three years. Not that I have been into practice for a long time, but five years is a good enough time to understand where people are falling short and what is the miscommunication between the clinical end and the pathologist end. That is the comments part. According to me, they play a very important role. You've described the features. You've said what the surgeon thought of it clinically. You've said what is your histopathological diagnosis of it. At times, you don't want to fit it in a very typical category. What is the surgeon supposed to take from it? He will not understand because you have not given a very typical diagnosis. In that case, we stress on it in the comments, which mentions the details of the diagnosis in times of dispute with the clinical impression or otherwise. And one more very important thing that I always like to mention in the comment section is the your as dentist will tell the patient you need to come for follow-up, you need to see for the recurrence of the lesion. When written in black and white, the patient will definitely follow it more. If he's forgotten it six months down the line, he opens his medical file for something else and he says, no doctor had said that probably it may recur or there is a follow-up requirement, they may still be a little more palatable with it. May also mention the next step required. This is what I do, especially in case of cancer patients, because there are certain surgeons who told me, what do you want us to do next? Of course, I will speak of all surgeons at my level probably. Senior people will definitely be a lot more aware of it. But the next step would be, for example, if you've got the radiological investigations done, have you got the CTs done, have you got the USGs done, that is what is required by the surgeon, that is required. what is required by the operating doctor, where we are going to refer the patient to, so on and so forth, all of it is pretty much mentioned in the comments thing. This essentially encompasses the entire report, which you can put forth to the patient, which you can explain to the patient at that point. Now, why do you need a biopsy? Because this was excellently put by a textbook called Neville. You have a hyperkeratotic lesion. You can see the entire hyperkeratotic lesion. All the purple, purple color we have, that's completely hyperkeratosis. That is basically excessive keratin present. If you see the red color portion in this photograph, it shows you that there is normal epithelium, there is keratosis, there is just plain leukoplakia, there is keratosis. And at the extreme end, you have a squamous cell carcinoma developing, and still there is keratosis. So the patient will present to you with the keratotic portion you will see a thick white colored layer on the buccal mucosa. Do you justify that leukoplakia should not be biopsy or varicose hypoplasia should not be biopsy? I would think otherwise because you don't know what is happening inside. Hence a requirement for, hence the necessity of a biopsy. Procedure of a biopsy, most of you all are aware of it. We always require a desirable and narrow and a deep biopsy because we need to leave a see the stroma underlying as well. Now, Biopsy, yes, you need a scalpel, you need to cut the tissue, definitely. But there are also some other examples where we can consider fine needle aspiration cytology. If uh, you go to the fifth floor of Tata Memorial and you go to the Department of Cytopathology, Kane Madhu is the head there. She, this is her main forte, wherein because FNAC is highly sensitive and specific for tumors of the selected gland example, that is just one example I'm giving. This has become a very important tool as well. At the same time, you're not cutting open the patient. So the patient's also kind of relieved. You're just doing an initial biopsy. You definitely see a malignancy. You can plan the treatment and then go on with it. The other aspect is aspiration cytology. I don't know how many of you are practicing, but many a times if you call an oral surgeon, especially for the examination of uh, clinical swelling, for example, and if it is intrapony, we take it a step further. You will see the surgeon asking for the oral pathologist who is whoever is there on the panel there, because they will just want to aspirate and see what is seen in the aspirate. Well, we will just ask why do you need an aspirate. Firstly, you inject a thick more needle into the lesion. Secondly, you aspirate. You get fluid, it indicates something. What type of fluid it indicates. What color of fluid it indicates. You don't get anything. You know it's probably a tumorous mass. There is no cyst like mass. So on and so forth. And all this is seen on the radiograph just as a plain radio lucid Right? Hence, aspiration cytology, although not very important, but definitely has its own space. Smear preparation is something which we probably 
just collect the sample, put it up on a slide, put a cover slip on top, and then view it under a microscope, and we should be able to tell. As uh, Afshan Madden covered it, brush biopsy is something which is also practiced by a lot of people. It is definitely good for screening and requires a lesser armamentarium. But although at the end of it, if you definitely get a positive answer, you need a regular biopsy to confirm the cancer as well. There are other non-invasive techniques. I won't go into the depth of it, as Afshan Madden has already explained, like for example, busy light and telescope, which help you demarcate the malignant cells uh, compared to the normal cells. Uh, rather, I should say the dysplastic cells. You also have a method called vital staining, extremely expensive, helps you to divide the site of biopsy. Now, just in short, a brief overview, commonly encountered lesions in the, uh, that you're going to see in your daily practice. One is, of course, hyperkeratosis, like I covered. You should always biopsy it first. Then you have leukoplakia. Now, all of us know, we've all read third year, we've all passed third year, we've all given up on our exams. So I won't get into the depth of the age and everything. But Commonly, with leukoplakia, of course, you should be a little careful when you're seeing it in tobacco chewers. Also, it may be caused due to frictional trauma. It is very commonly seen as innocuous lesions. That means the patient is going to be asymptomatic. It's going to be a chance finding when the patient is coming. Hence, it is your duty that when you're examining the tooth, also reflect the mucosa and have a look at it. OSMF Soros covers, uh, covered it brilliantly. He's covered everything, practically whatever I have to say now. Then you have lichen planus, which of course the patient is going to be symptomatic because of which he will come to a dental clinic to seek treatment. You need a thorough case history, that's one of the most basic things because we know stress is a factor. At the same time, lichen planus is also known to flare up a little after uh, a biopsy, but still a biopsy would be recommended because it has a domat involvement, it has got a dermatological basis. There may be other lesions on the body which you need to rule out. Being dentists, we are seeing only the oral cavity, a biopsy done, you can accordingly forward it and the patient can be taken care of. Ulcerative lesions, needless to say, you need to establish the origin, whether it's infectious, immunological, or plastic. And then you have, of course, abscess ulcers. Patients are not going to come to you for abscess ulcers because I'm sure everybody has experienced it more than once in their life. Usually, if they do take a detailed uh, history again, especially for dealing with stress, and they, if they've come to you, they've probably had repeated bouts of ulcerations. If chronically occurring, always rule out other causes such as gastric causes and other nutritional disorders. Oral cancer, that is what we are dealing with right now over here, is basically something which should be seen as a non-healing ulcer. Firstly, what I have got from a lot of dentists is that they get scared of oral cancer. There is nothing to get scared of. It is your duty to diagnose and then refer the patient. As general dentist, if you are a specialist, of course you will know what is to be done. But as a general dentist, you just need to diagnose it and then refer the patient further. It may be seen as a non-healing ulcer, proliferative growth. There may be mobility of teeth, which is not going to match the periodontal condition. What I mean is, there is not going to be enough calculus and stains to form to cause that level of periodontitis. It may be seen only in the section of the mouth as well. It may also happen, this we have seen in a few cases wherein it has happened because of chronic irritation, because of a malaligned third molar, which was continuously jutting into the buccal because of the patient. The patient came with mobile teeth, the dentist obviously extracted it, and then later on they realized that it was actually a carcinoma developing. But always, of course, inquire about the tobacco related habits. The eight step oral cancer screening process, wherein you have to reflect the entire mucosa, check it thoroughly, always look. You've been given a mirror, it's not only to see the teeth, it is also to reflect, and also to reflect the oral mucosa in the mirror, which you can probably examine. It will take less than a minute, trust me, it takes around 30 to 40 seconds for you to just see the entire mouth. Management of the patient pretty much. You can counsel the patient as uh, emphasized on that. Spend two minutes with the patient. Give them a little bit of counseling. Tell them the ill effects of tobacco and alcohol. Again, it's not that they are not aware of. They all go to movie theaters. They all see the oral cancer 